I'd like to thank you guys for inviting me to speak about our work. Um, our goal is to address the problem of uh, variance, uh, variance of uncertain significance through the development of high quality, high throughput functional assays. I'm going to tell you about two applications of that to the tumor suppressor BRCA1. So although the very famous hereditary breast and ovarian cancer risk gene, BRCA1, has been sequenced in at least 1.5 million people and has been um, the subject of countless research dollars, um, there are still 350 variants of uncertain significance across the gene. Um, in the literature, and there could be many more that have been you know, reported by a myriad of different genetic testing companies. Um, I'm just, somebody have the drum set. We're going to need this drum set. <laughs> Conventionally, um, we have uh, tried to interpret the impact of variation um, through classical genetic experiments, like retrospective or familial studies, um, or one-off functional assays, but at the rate we're discovering VUSs in very important genes like BRCA1, these methods, while they're high, highly accurate, they lack the throughput these days. Um, on the other hand, computational predictions of, pathogen, uh, path, of uh, variant pathogenicity are obviously scalable. Um, and as Daniel and Doug showed yesterday, they are getting much better, but they still um, could use uh, some more, uh, more work. So uh, as a potential path forward that provides validity and throughput, we've been developing a toolkit of methods for functionally assessing hundreds to thousands of variants in a single experiment. So we do this with massively parallel functional assays, and they can be very different depending on your protein or your gene of interest. Um, we call them massively parallel reporter assays when we're looking at, uh, to, when we're looking to assess mutations in regulatory regions, demutational scanning when we're looking at protein function, and saturation genome editing um, when we look to multiplex genome editing to look at either protein function or splicing. These assays measure different mutational effects, but they always consist of a few key steps. Um, first, we generate a library that contains all the variants um, for the sequence of interest. Uh, we and others have developed several ways to do this, um, and then we introduce those libraries into cells. And next, uh, we functionally characterize the variant library in a multiplex assay, meaning that although the all the variants are present um, within the assay, we can simultaneously measure their activity. Um, and for each, we might measure the, like for example, we might measure the abundance of uh, each mutation within a population of cells. Um, both before and after a competitive growth assay, which is dependent on that protein of interest. The key here is that we can separate cells with, um, that harbor functional and non-functional variants, whether it be through flow sorting, um, affinity purification, or differential growth. Um, and this is by far the hardest part of development of any of these experiments. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then we measure the abundance of each of these variants by high throughput sequencing before and after the selection using next generation technology. And finally, we analyze the changes in abundance to estimate the effect size for specific mutations on the functional activity of any sequence of interest. And today I'll tell you about our effort to apply um, deep mutational scanning and saturation genome editing to missense mutations in BRCA1. So the first question when developing one of these assays are what are the biochemical and cellular functions of the protein that we could build assays around? Uh, so first, BRCA1 is a large protein encoded over 24 exons, and all of those clearly have to be spliced correctly. Um, and then after greatly oversimplifying the cellular role of BRCA1, the full-length protein is required for homology-directed DNA repair, um, and that's abbreviated HDR. I'll be using that a lot. Um, the HDR activity is required for tumor suppression. Um, BRCA1 has to dimerize with this other protein, BARD1. Um, otherwise, it doesn't fold at all. Um, the two proteins interact at their N-terminal uh, ring domains, and together they actually form an active ubiquinin ligase. And most amino acid substitutions uh, that have been found to be pathogenic in the protein are actually in the ring domain or the BRCT at the other end. But what we really want to get at is whether or not variants affect BRCA1's tumor suppressor function, but um, we can't do those experiments. 
But we do know, as I told you, that the um, ring domain of BRCA1 must bind to BARD1 in order for the entire protein to fold and function, because if it doesn't uh, do this, it just gets degraded. Um, so to start, we developed two assays for um, two functions of the ring domain, and I'll tell you about those experiments first. And later, I'll tell you about our lab's effort um, to test the effects of SNVs on splicing in exon 18 using a different technology. First, we tested the effects of the ring domain, uh, effects of mutation in the ring domain on the ubiquitin ligase activity using a multiplex phage based system that I had developed. Um, again, we used DNA sequencing to track the abundance of each variant before, during, and after selection for this function. Um, variants with deleterious effects become depleted from the population. Um, and we visualize these effects in a sequence function map like, um, like Doug told you about yesterday. So on the x-axis, we have every position in the uh, ring domain, and on the y-axis, all the possible amino acid changes. And above are just diagrammed um, the structural features of BRCA, of, the, of this domain. Shades of blue represent variants that were depleted relative to wild type, and red represents variants that were enriched during selection. So we took the same library and we tested for um, effects of variants on the ability of the BRCA1 ring domain to bind to the BARD domain, and we did this using a multiplex these two hybrid assay. Again, sequencing the population, um, sequencing the population at multiple time points, and um, yeah. So there are striking patterns in these maps. Um, so you can see, oops. You can see here that uh, these are stop codons, and they are bad for function. So that's a it's a <laughs> um, it's a nice control. Uh, we always like to see that that's working. Um, additionally, uh, these areas in loops one and two of the ring domain are required for ubiquitin ligase function, and in general, those are more deleterious to protein function than other mutations. Whereas in the same domain, or in the same regions, uh, for BARD binding, really only the zinc binding uh, amino acids uh, that are really important for the structure of BRCA1 um, are uh, really intolerant to mutation. We also found regions in the four helix bundle, um, this is actually new information, um, that these four helix bundle uh, amino acids are really required for binding. Uh, there's really interesting things in these maps. As a biochemist, a uh, trained biochemist, for example, there's a arginine to lysine change that makes the ubiquitin ligase 100 times better. Who knew? Um, you know, and these are really fascinating, but that's not what we're interested in. <laughs> um, ideally, we'd like to use our data uh, that we collected to, in model organisms to estimate the likelihood that any variant um, would be either pathogenic or benign for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, however, there are only 18 variants um, classified as pathogenic and three as benign in the domain, and we can't, that's not enough to build an accurate model. But what we do have are um, HDR rescue experiments uh, for many more BRCA1 variants. Um, and so thus far, all the um, HDR activity assay for BRCA1 has been 100% um, specific and sensitive to um, both benign and pathogenic mutations in, in the protein. So we felt like this was a good proxy. Um, so we trained a support vector regression to transform, oh, geez, <laughs> um, to transform our ubiquitin ligase and barred binding scores into HDR um, activity predictions. And when we, um, we next compared the accuracy of our model um, using leave one out cross, uh, cross validation to uh, variant effect predictors like polyphen and CAD, and you can see that they do a fairly poor job um, predicting the effects of amino acid substitution in BRCA1 on its HDR function. Um, molecular effect uh, predictors, Grantham and Align GBGD, do a little bit better, um, but our um, empirically derived um, uh, E3 and barred binding scores do a lot better at predicting whether or not the um, full length protein is going to be functional. In addition, when we add the um, best performing molecular effect predictor, align GBGD, to our data and retrain the model, we don't gain any extra information. 
Since we had trained a good model, we applied it to our data to predict HDR activity of the BRCA1 variants that had been identified in patients through clinical testing, and the results are shown in these histograms. Um, all of the benign variants have predict are predicted to have high HDR function, whereas most of the pathogenic ones have low HDR function. We misidentify this guy, um, but these two are splice variants, and this is a caveat of using cDNAs, and I'm going to tell you about assays that can get at splice variants next. But um, what we do find also is that six variants that are currently classified as VUS are predicted to have very poor activity, whereas 13 are predicted to be just fine. But beyond those just seen in patients, we have an additional 1,200 variants that we can use to predict HDR function. There's a bimodal distribution of predicted effects, so while some variants are predicted to have poor HDR activity, many more would have wild-type HDR activity. So while we would predict that proteins that, or amino acid mutations that fall here have done so much damage to the protein that we would predict them to be um, pathogenic, whereas um, the guys in the HDR func uh, high HDR, or that are predicted to have high HDR function might be benign except, um, again, these are cDNAs, and we really don't know anything about splicing. So I'm going to um, tell you about our work um, to, uh, to assess SNVs on exon 18 splicing using saturation genome editing, which is a slightly different um, method. So the first step in a saturation genome editing experiment is to transfect CRISPR-Cas9 and a guide RNA um, targeting your sequence of interest, and in this case, it was exon 18 of BRCA1. And to edit the genome, we also transfect um, a, a, a library of repair templates that contains SNVs over the exon of interest. At a low rate, the repair templates are incorporated into the genome, and this creates a heterogeneous population of cells. Um, and after five days, um, the genomic DNA and the RNA are, select, are uh, collected and selected P selective PCR that only uh, amplifies the edited genomic DNA and uh, cDNA um, are used to amplify the exon. Like before, each variant in the uh, genomic DNA and the RNA are, uh, samples are counted by next generation sequencing, and the effect of each variant in splicing is determined by looking at um, the, the ratio of the uh, RNA over the genomic DNA. Again, um, for cDNAs that are depleted, that ratio will be, will be lower. Shown here are the ranked ratios of cDNA to gDNA for a single experiment. And you can see that edits where a splice enhancer um, is created, um, shown enrichment or a stable amount of cDNA. Whereas when splice silencers or nonsense mediated or uh, nonsense mutations that trigger nonsense mediated decay are created, um, those RNAs uh, tend to be depleted from the sample. And this is a sequence function map for splice effects in, uh, for 98 percent of the possible nucleotide changes across exon 18. You can see um, where there are large depletions of cDNA. It was either um, due to a position being changed to a nonsense codon and therefore triggering nonsense mediated decay, or um, in most cases they were also predicted to be um, effect splicing by the mute pred algorithm, and this guy right here is a VUS um, valine 1714G, so uh, I would say that that's probably pretty bad. <laughs> um, so clearly we're in need of new technologies to deliver on the promise of genetic medicine, um, and we believe that massively parallel technologies like the deep mutational scans of the BRCA1 ring domain and the saturation genome editing um, of exon 18 that I told you about represent at least a partial um, solution to the problem of VUSs. But I, I, I don't want to discount what we've already done, but as you might have already noticed, BRCA1 is a lot bigger than its ring domain or just exon 18. Um, in addition, there are many more genes that one might say are high-value targets. In my mind, I see the um, hereditary cancer risk gene panels, um, but many people in the room probably have their own list of genes. Um, there are challenges for scaling up. As I told you, um, the first step in these experiments is library construction and variant delivery, and we think we're actually pretty good at that. And the next thing we would need are parallelizable assays for protein function. 
Um, and we're working, as Doug was uh, telling you yesterday, about kind of more generic assays that get at protein folding. Um, but we're not biologists, <laughs> um, so if anybody has um, assays for their favorite gene of interest, we'd be interested in hearing about them. Um, it would also be great if uh, there were a suite of genes that could be tested using the same assay because this is the most difficult part. So for example, um, BRCA1 and um, a lot of the other proteins that are involved in double-strand break repair can all be tested in the same assay, which is very nice. Um, sequencing of variants, we've got that. Um, Doug's group has built a very nice computational scoring pipeline. And then again, we'd like to use these scores to calculate likelihood estimates for pathogenicity or damage to the protein, and we'll just need access to um, large-scale projects like Exact and the um, forthcoming PMI. So um, we believe we could, you know, by doing more scans of high-value targets, we um, the, that information could be useful like immediately. That would create better databases. So when somebody comes in with a new mutation um, or a new variant, that those scores would be out there, and then those um, those those data can be used to build better variant effect prediction models, like um, like Doug was telling you about yesterday. And I'd like to thank all the people that um, helped me with that work. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have, as you remember the format, we'll have some time for a few questions for this presentation, and then we'll also have the open discussion. And the, the good news is there's only about 20,000 candidates for your list. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think you're, you'll be in very good shape for a while. Um, um, sorry? All right. Dan Roden's being literal. So, uh, well, <laughs> yes, 40,000 Dan. All right, Howard? So, uh, so that was very impressive. I'm just curious on what cost and scale. So in, and so in terms of scaling up, what's the cost uh, and what's the time window? Because I think part of the challenge in thinking about how do we go forward on this is, um, so can you give us some feedback on, on what the cost and time would be to do what you just did? Uh, well, we were learning. I was exploring a lot of the space around uh, experimental mistakes. <laughs> um, so now that we've got some of that down, um, it, it, it takes a, a bit. But again, it's the, it's the um, functional assay, the building of a functional assay that takes the longest. Um, so if somebody came to us with, you know, biology in hand, you know, we can build the libraries and get the sequencing done and do the experiments within a few months. Um, it's the, and then the data analysis on the other end is also the hard part. Um, so building these models and, you know, building error models about around, you know, whatever the, the assay is, is, is actually quite difficult. So would that be 250,000 for the gene and six months of two postdocs? I mean, because I'm just trying to get a sense. I, I, I get you had to build it. But I mean, if right. we're thinking about scaling and trying to do 20,000 or whatever the number is, mm -hmm. um, it's just useful to get an idea of what does that mean. What does that mean? Oh, there's. <laughs> Let's go, boys. I don't think it's 20,000. I mean, I think most of, right now, what most of us are returning is the ACMG 56. So, you know, that's where you'd start. You start with something that's practical, manageable, in the context of what we're actually trying to return. You know, it's those genes where the VUSs are causing the biggest problem. So I, I think it's a much smaller number than you guys are talking about. And even in the context of, of um, somatic uh, sequencing in cancer, uh, we might have 700 genes on our targeted panel, but only about 150 of them are regularly returning results that we even think about acting on. So uh, you're right. right, the universe is not 20,000, um, but it's also more than one. Yes, um, and also, you know, we could, we're hoping that by, you know, taking large gene families, for example, the ring domain mm -hmm. is, there's a family of 600 of them in the, in the human genome, so we're hoping that um, some of our results, at least, will build better predictive models immediately for, for entire families of genes. Peter O'Donnell. Um, is your model trying to replicate the germline or somatic situation? And by that I mean, you know, it, the function might be different in the germline setting where it's the only gene mutated as opposed to the somatic situation where there's a bunch of other genes that are also mutated. <sighs> That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I think we're really just trying to get at the function of that protein. 
Um, so we're trying to build these assays so that they are sensitive to mutations in that protein and that protein only. Um, so I, I guess it shouldn't really matter if it's germline or somatic, but um, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> All right, um, it'll be Mike and Calum and Gail, and then we'll stop, uh, we'll have the next session. So Mike. It's really interesting work. I have a question about the splicing component, and mm -hmm. perhaps it's too early to know the answer to this. Right. But do you have a sense of, when, when you looked at exon 18 and BRCA1, where was most of what you're finding things that would be generalizable to other exons? Or is most of what you're finding something specific about the regulation of that particular exon, exon joining event? Because I'm wondering, are you creating a resource that you could use to study all of splicing? Right. Um, so actually, most of what we, we found with the splicing actually is fairly similar to what's predicted by algorithms that are already out there. So I don't think there was anything special about exon 18 um, in particular. It's um, just more to show that we can, we can do these experiments, um, you know, in at scale and in multiplexed assays, I think, was more at the point of that experiment. But yeah, there wasn't really anything special about Exxon 18. Um. Cal? You alluded to sort of universal assays or more broadly uh, focused assays. Right. Have, you, have you tried any um, uh, super unsupervised or supervised learning methods with a, sim with a sim simple cell system or something along those lines? There are some very successful phenotype-driven drug screens that have been powerful even for uh, non-cell autonomous phenotypes in cell autonomous states? Uh, we have not tried that. Um, we, we're looking at generic stability assays right now, and that, that will be an interesting thing to apply to those, I think, um, you know, machine learning algorithms. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad someone else said the ACMG56. Um, one of the other classes in that, besides cancer gene, are the channel genes and cardiac arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. And I guess I've wondered about, it's not as scalable, but uh, Xenopus oocytes and looking at channels and whether one could think of something like that for that group and whether any of the folks here who work in some of the models could say something about that. So. We have the Fowler reagents in our lab, and we're starting not with, we, we, we picked the wrong channel to work on first because we picked a really big channel to work on first. So we're doing the same thing Doug did, and, and we're sort of honing in on a particular domain. And the, the really interesting question is whether you can develop high throughput assays that don't rely on electrophysiology. There are multiplexed electrophysiologic assays that you could do in, in, in multi-plate, in multi-well formats that allow electrophysiologic readouts. We think we can, what we're trying to look at is, is generic questions like, does this variant uh, prevent a channel from getting to the cell surface? Does this variant uh, allow a channel to find its partners or not? So those are going to be easier for th high throughput, but at the end of the day, we may end up having to do the electrophysiologic measurement. It'll probably be in a transfected cell as opposed to a frog egg, which is, which is big and technically not the right way to do it. And, and the other idea, of course, is to incorporate IPS cells into all this, which is sort of like down the road, I think, way down the road. Yeah. Doug is nodding. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> there yet, yes. Yes. <laughs> Great. Leah, thank you very much. It's excellent. Thanks.